Hello and welcome to the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. In Season 2, Episode 6, today we're going to be covering some complications of pregnancy, including third trimester bleeding and complications of infectious disease during pregnancy. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review, and I am excited to be here once again covering OB. I just had an uh, email from somebody saying they're they're covering women's health now, and could I hurry up and finish the section? Unfortunately, at this stage in my career and in my life, I can only do uh, one episode where we're doing every two weeks right now on schedule. Every Tuesday, it gets released at about six in the morning, uh, and I'm just barely keeping up with the every other week schedule that I've set up at this point. So unfortunately, um, the, the information is going to come out a little slower uh, than you'd like. I'd love to do this full time and get it out every uh, once a week, but I, right now that's just not going to happen. Anyhow, so this week we're going to be covering some complications of uh, during pregnancy. During uh, We're going to get to labor very soon, but right now we're going to cover just towards the end, third trimester bleeding and infectious complications of pregnancy or during pregnancy rather and some of the issues that go along with that so there's a whole lot to cover here there's a whole lot of really good test questions here i talked a little bit about last week uh in an email i sent out to the people on the email list talked a little bit about making sure that you cover uh make sure that you really know the easy stuff the things that they're going to ask questions on the things that make it super simple to ask questions on and this is another section i think that that's really very true it's really easy to ask questions about the infectious disease part it's really easy to ask questions about the uh, third trimester bleeding as you'll see as we move forward so without uh anything else let's jump in and start off with our questions a patient presents to your office in the third trimester of her pregnancy with vaginal bleeding what are the three most important diagnoses you should be thinking of? What are the three most important diagnoses you should be thinking of with third trimester bleeding? Number one, placenta previa. Number two, placental abruption. And number three, preterm labor. And those are really, we're going we're gonna to skip preterm labor for this week because we'll get into that. Uh, for a couple different reasons as we move forward. Uh, but placenta previa and placenta, placental abruption are two that we're really going to get into today. A patient at 36 weeks presents with vaginal bleeding. Why don't you do a digital exam? What's your concern about doing a digital exam in a patient who has vaginal bleeding during the third trimester? And the answer here is placenta previa. I'll explain why in just a little bit. What is considered advanced maternal age? What's advanced maternal age? Greater than 35 years old is advanced maternal age. All right, so let's jump in. Uh, third trimester bleeding. Placenta previa is where we're going to start. Like I said, we're going to cover placenta previa and placental abruption are our two major topics for that for today. So uh, this is when the placenta has implanted over the cervical ah, so over the opening where the baby needs to get out through. That's placenta previa. Uh, previa comes from the Latin word a previa, it's P-R-A-E-V-I-A, -E uh, which means to go before. Um, so there's a Latin pretext of go before. And that means that, the, and what that means, and this is something that people have trouble holding on to the difference between placenta previa and placental abruption. And I think it's something that you can easily focus on and uh, hold on to for test questions. I think it makes it a lot easier if you don't confuse these two. So previa comes from the Latin word previa, which means to go before. So what this means is that the, what that describes is the placenta going before the baby out through the cervical ass, which is obviously a major issue. Um, this can either be partially or completely covering the cervical ass. Um, and again, this is why you don't want to do a digital exam on a patient with third trimester bleeding because you don't want to disturb the placenta and cause significant bleeding. That's, of course, our major concern here is that um, the mother can end up from the placenta can have really significant bleeding and can cause, have all kinds of trouble secondary to that. Risk factors for having placenta previa would be advanced maternal age, which we said just a minute ago was 35 years old, smoking, a history of a C-section, history of D&C, and multiparity. Now, the reason for those, those um, especially those last three, is that if there's scarring in the, u in the uterus, the, the, the placenta will look to attach somewhere where there's not scarring. So if you have a history of a C-section, you'll have scarring on the uterus. A uh, history of DNC, you could have some scarring in the uterus. And multiparity, there's just less room. Um, if there's two placentas, there's more likelihood that it would be covering that cervical ass. Like we said, multiparity increases your risks for most of this stuff throughout pregnancy. Uh, your clinical presentation here is painless third trimester bleeding. 
painless third trimester bleeding. And we're going to contrast that directly with the placental abruption, which is our second topic, which is going to have painful third trimester bleeding. And that's where your easy test questions are going to come in, your easy key terms. Painless third trimester bleeding is going to be placenta previa. Diagnostic tests, how you're going to figure this out. Ultrasound is going to be really reliable in diagnosing placenta previa. CBC, because you're going to want to have, uh, and hemoglobin, you're going to want to be monitoring mom. Coagulation studies and typing crosses, especially as you get closer to delivery dates, because this could get into a situation very quickly where mom's going to need some blood. The treatment here is going to be close monitoring. Because you're going to be at an increased risk for preterm labor, you're going to want to give the baby corticosteroids between 24 and 32 weeks to promote lung development. Baby's going to be delivered by C-section. And again, this is going to be diagnosed on ultrasound pretty early, typically. Uh, so I see this every once in a while in my practice because I assist on sections. And patients come in. Um, they've known they have a preview for a while, so everyone's aware. Um, like I said, the type and crosses are done. Everybody's paying attention and a little bit close, more closely monitoring. And then the baby is delivered through C-section, and typically everything goes just fine, provided everybody knows ahead of time and uh, <laughs> things are pre-planned. Um, obviously, blood transfusions if necessary. And... Uh, nothing per vagina during the pregnancy. So we're going to contrast placenta previa with placental abruption. Placental abruption is our other third trimester bleeding uh, concern. And this is the premature detachment of an otherwise normal placenta from the uterine wall. So what happens is you have a normal, normal uh, pregnancy carrying along, baby's doing just fine. And then for uh, whatever reason, the placenta starts to detach from the wall of the uterus. Now, as we said before, this is painful third trimester bleeding, okay? And you can see that in your, in your mind's eye. You can think about that. As the uterus, as the placenta detaches from the uterus, that becomes a very painful. And that's where you get painful third trimester bleeding. As opposed to placental, placenta previa, which just means that the placenta is sitting over the cervical os, there's nothing happening. So there's no pain, but as it gets disturbed, it can bleed. Here, the placenta is is tearing off the inside of the uterus. Uh, and this occurs in about 1% of pregnancies. And the issue is fetal demise can be as high as 20 to 40%, and maternal morbidity is as high as 1%. So this is a real issue, placental abruption. Risk factors here, again, advanced maternal age, smoking, cocaine use, use of alcohol, multiple gestations again, preeclampsia, hypertension, uterine abnormalities, history of placental abruption, abdominal trauma, and decreased folic acid levels. Let me run through those one more time real quick. Uh, risk factors for placental abruption would be advanced maternal age, smoking, cocaine use, use of alcohol, multiple gestations, preeclampsia, hypertension, uterine abnormalities, history of placental abruption, abdominal trauma, and decreased folic acid levels. Clinical presentation, we said again, was painful third trimester bleeding. Again, that's just such an easy key term. An easy thing to try to confuse you on an exam is giving you a patient with third trimester bleeding and making you parse out placental abruption versus placenta previa. It's really, they're pretty dramatically different. They're different things. They have different presentations. Uh, but because the names sound kind of the same, we struggle with them. Uh, so they have painful third trimester bleeding. They can have abdominal or back pain. Vaginal bleeding is present in 85% of the cases. The uterus can become hypertonic, irritable, and tender. You can get bleeding into the myometrium and then into the peritoneal cavity from there, which sounds uh, pretty painful. Um, so so the, the bleeding from the abruption can actually go into the myometrium, so into the muscle of the uterus, and then throughout and into the peritoneal cavity. Obviously, this is a major issue. Uh, and then fetal heart irregularities may be part of the presentation. Diagnostic tests. So obviously, our diagnosis of choice or our, our test of choice for pregnant people is the ultrasound. Uh, and unfortunately, in this case, it's not really reliable. So you can use the ultrasound to monitor fetal distress. And then you'll notice fetal distress will vary with the degree of separation of the placenta. So again, we're going to do CBCs and hemoglobin on everybody. We're going to do coagulation studies and type and cross just to be safe and if, in case we need um, to transfuse. Treatment. Uh, delivery is the definitive treatment. So getting the baby out is a lot of times the best solution. And the problem with that is depends on how far along the baby is. So there's a little bit of a balancing act uh, because if it's a partial or a slight placental abruption, so if only a small part of the placenta is off the uterine lining, 
and the baby's say 20, 22 weeks, then you may not want to deliver it right away. Uh, so there's a balancing act here, but the definitive treatment, you know, probably your test isn't going to give you, make you parse out that kind of stuff. The definitive treatment is going to be deliver the baby. Um, I've come across where it says you can do a vaginal and C-section, I mean, or C-section are preferred methods. Um, the, the real idea here is you want to control blood loss. You want to make sure everybody's safe and you want to absolutely do everything you can to control blood loss. So uh, that's the real answer as far as uh, delivery goes. But it's definitely get the baby out as soon as possible, sort of like preeclampsia. You're going to watch, depending on your timing, how far along through the pregnancy you are. But the real answer to solve the problem is to deliver the baby. All right. Well, that's our third trimester bleeding. So it's it's really just those two. And again, um, we'll get into premature labor a little bit down the road. Uh, it's not as hard to parse out as these two are. Like I said, th these aren't that similar. They're not that hard to remember. But because the terms sound kind of alike, we struggle with them. So I think that's something you should focus on, something you should quiz yourself on in order to keep track of those two, the differences between the two. Um, again, I, I just think it's easy to ask questions on that. Infectious complications of pregnancy. So we're just going to run through some common infections that can occur during pregnancy, things we treat, things we watch out for. Obviously, um, you can have a huge list of this, but mine is uh, <laughs> it's just going to cover uh, what I think is most important here. So group B strep, up to 30% of pregnant women are asymptomatic carriers of group B strep. Uh, an active group B strep infection at the time of delivery can be very bad for both the mom and the baby, whether the child is delivered vaginally or by C-section. Mom can develop a urinary tract infection and endometriitis and all kinds of other stuff. The newborn can develop pneumonia, sepsis, and meningitis. Obviously, these are really bad situations. So we want to try and prevent this. And it turns out it's really easy to prevent. Vaginal cultures for group B strep are done at 35 to 37 weeks. Gestation, that way we, excuse me, that way we have an idea um, if mom is a group B strep carrier or not. Our treatment here, if the cultures are positive or if we don't have cultures, we're going to go ahead and treat. We're going to give antibiotics during labor. So if somebody comes in off the street, if for some reason uh, they didn't have cultures done, if we don't have that history, uh, they're just going to get antibiotics at the, time of, at the time of labor or at the time of the C-section. Penicillin is the most commonly used antibiotic. Uh, you can use ampicillin, clindamycin, and vanco. Uh, these are if there are penicillin allergy, but penicillin is the most commonly used antibiotic for group B strep. Urinary tract infections. Um, during pregnancy, the, uh, the risks of urinary tract infections go up. Uh, women are more likely to get them. And a urinary tract infection may increase the risk of preterm labor. So we want to make sure we go ahead and treat those. Uh, a urine culture is performed as part of a routine prenatal care on most visits. Uh, ampicillin, cephaloxin, and nitrofontin, which is macrobid, are all good choices to treat urinary tract infections. HIV and AIDS, there'll be a whole section on this later on. Um, when, uh, as with all this, as we cover uh, infectious disease and other issues. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here. Um, I'm just going to cover it as far as it's concerned with uh, vertical transmission. So HIV and AIDS uh, does not have any effect on the ability to get pregnant, nor does it alter the course of the pregnancy. So it doesn't actually affect the pregnancy, doesn't affect getting pregnant. Um, it also doesn't cross the placenta from everything I came across, everything I could find. It doesn't cross the placenta. So a lot like the RH um, incompatibility. So you have a, the, the baby is separated from the mom by the placenta and the placenta exchanges nutrients and all kinds of other stuff, but the red blood cells don't cross it. And apparently HIV also does not cross the placenta in most, in most cases is base is what I came across, which means there's got to be some kind of trauma between mom and baby in a mixing of fluids in order to, uh, pass on or get that vertical transmission of HIV. Now, just like before with RH, um, incompatibilities, there is trauma that's called delivery. <laughs> and there's a good chance with cervical mucus and everything else that those do mix. We'll get into that in a little bit. So you're going to screen everybody early on with an ELISA screening for HIV. Again, we're not going to get into that here. What that means, we'll cover that at a later date. Um, treatments. Transmission rates from mother to baby are between 25 and 45%, according to the World Health Organization. 25 to 45%, if untreated, there is a, a vertical transmission of HIV from mom to baby. Transmission rates between 1% and 8% with proper treatment, so we can dramatically reduce those risks. Treatment is going to be anti antiretroviral therapy throughout the pregnancy for mom and six weeks of antiretrovirals for the newborn. Again, we're not going to go into details about specific treatment uh, plans here. Something to note um, that I, I had forgotten until I pulled this up, HIV can be transmitted through breast milk. 
So it's recommended the patient's bottle feed. So we're going to watch out for um, issues during the pregnancy that trauma can pass HIV from mom to baby when we have the fluids mixing. And then uh, breast milk postpartum can be an issue as well. So we're going to be treating throughout, treating for six weeks, the baby for six weeks after the delivery. And then we're going to bottle feed. All right, next, genital herpes. Uh, neonatal herpes can be fatal and very, very serious. This has become much less of an issue today uh, in, in most of the developed countries because we are treating this aggressively and it really has become less of an issue. Um, I've seen this once where a patient came in to deliver and we went up doing a C-section because she had active uh, genital herpes. Um, but again, so I jump ahead and the treatment, <laughs> treatment is going to be do a C-section if the patient has active genital herpes because we absolutely want to avoid a neonat neonatal infection. Um, clinical presentation, like I said, is just an active herpes chancre. Uh, and this is not, this is, this is, tends to be obvious. Patients are aware of it. Um, one thing you can do for patients if they know they have a history of genital herpes is give them acyclovir starting at 36 weeks uh, gestation. That way they can help to try to prevent an active disease during the time of delivery because it's really just the timing. If, the, if they're active at the time of delivery, then it's going to be a C-section. Um, if it's not active, then you're pretty much okay. Syphilis is next. Uh, vertical transmission can occur at any time during pregnancy, so a little bit different here. Any time during pregnancy, this can be passed along. Um, syphilis can be pretty nasty for a developing fetus. Uh, it can, you can develop, you can have late-term abortions, transplant, transplacental infection, congenital syphilis, intrauterine growth restrictions, and stillbirths. Um, and and the list goes on and on from there. But really, the, the bottom line is it's it's uh, pretty terrible. Labs and studies, uh, ultrasound for fetal abnormalities. All pregnant patients should have blood work to test for syphilis. It'll be part of your prenatal care. Um, but really, you're just going to be monitoring the baby for fetal abnormalities, and you can get a whole bunch of stuff. Um, like I said, it's a big list. I don't think it's something they're going to specifically test you on here, so I'm not going to go through it. Treatment is penicillin. Um, there's, You can do one dose, um, but more likely they do three doses uh, one week apart. Untreated, there's a 50 to 100% vertical transmission rate. Untreated, there's a 50 to 100% vertical transmission rate. And then properly treated, there's a 1% to 2% vertical transmission rate. So just like HIV, we can have done a really good job of uh, making sure we don't get neonatal infections. So that depends largely on uh, treatment plans and how well we're monitoring these things. Two common things that come up uh, in everybody and then can certainly come up during pregnancy, cholecystitis and appendicitis. Uh, clinical presentation for cholecystitis, that left upper quadrant pain, uh, same descriptions. Again, I'm not going to go into tons of detail here uh, because we'll get to them later on. Labs and studies are going to be your transaminase, alkaline phosphatase, and direct bilirubin may be significantly elevated. You're going to do an ultrasound. Treatment plans are going to be supportive care at first, including pain management, fluids, and antibiotics. And then lastly, you can go in uh, surgically, and laparoscopic is the currently the recommended way to go ahead and take these out. Appendicitis, clinical presentation is that right lower quadrant pain. And the anatomy might be different, so tenderness over McBurney's point may not be as helpful as it normally is. You can get nausea and vomiting here, but as anything during pregnancy, we add nausea and vomiting to our list of presentation factors, and it sort of isn't all that helpful. Labs and studies, you can do an ultrasound, and an MRI will be helpful if the ultrasound is not conclusive. Treatment is surgical removal of the inflamed appendix. And again, this is relatively safe uh, and much, much safer than a ruptured appendix. All right, fantastic. So that wraps up third tri trimester bleeding and infectious complications during pregnancy. Uh, we're going to move into preterm labor and labor and postpartum and all that good stuff. And then we'll move into more GYN stuff as the weeks come by. Um, but let's jump into our study tip for today. Study tip for today is something I've been working on uh, for myself, and I'm noticing quite an impact. And I think it's something people in, in school, as PA students, generally have, might not be taking as much advantage of, but generally have available to them, where people getting ready for their PANRI sort of don't. Um, and that's going to be someone to keep you accountable, someone to keep an eye on you, someone to report to. And what happens is, when you're in school, you do study groups, and that can be helpful because you have to get a certain amount of work done in order to participate and those sorts of things. Uh, when you're taking your PANRI, you, you feel very isolated. There's no one around 
taking their exam at the same time in most cases. Most people don't know anyone else who's taking the exam with them per se. They might know of people who just took it. They might know of someone at work who took it a year ago, but rarely are the, rarely is there someone on your same cycle. Uh, you know, I, I work in a group of four PAs. <laughs> so if we have a, if you have a six year cycle, uh, let alone when we get to the ten year cycle, we just don't match up. Um, and I see other PAs and I hear about when they're taking their tests and things. But for the most part, uh, you're sort of on your own. And like I said, this applies to you as well as in school because I think you can do a better job with this. As far as having someone to keep you accountable, to keep you working, it's so easy to <clears throat> set yourself up with a plan and then not complete the things because your spouse doesn't know if you did or not. Um, only you do, right? Your friends don't know if you did or not complete your work. It's really, if you blow it off for a day, nobody notices but you. And I think there's something very powerful in having someone else on board, having someone else help keep track of what you're supposed to be accomplishing and getting done in a day or in a week. And I think you can add a layer of accountability, even if you're in school, if you have your study group or your friends, I think you can make it a little bit more formal and it would be really helpful where you could get a friend and create a formal contract with them that you're going to email each other once a week and maybe send them uh, what you've gotten done this week and what you plan on getting done next week and have them do the same thing for you or you do the same thing for them. And if you're really nice, you can always check it over for the other person. But just the act of having to complete that paperwork and send it over, send it in, might be really, really helpful. So even if you're looking to take your pan re, um, it doesn't have to be someone else taking their test. It can be your spouse. Just make sure that you're absolutely accountable and you have to have that paper turned in to them, showing them what you did. You can make it a friend at work. You can make it somebody else. You can make it your parents. I, I, I don't know. But I'm sure <laughs> you can find somebody. And so, like I said, in school, it's a little bit easier. Uh, outside in practice, you can find someone. But I think that that accountability from someone else can keep you from procrastinating, can keep you from hiding, can keep you from not taking the action that you need to, because sometimes we get overwhelmed and people say, man, there's so much to know. I'm just going to sit here and watch television today because no one's going to know if I said it or not. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I'm going to the, to the coffee shop and I'm going to sit and study and I wind up on Facebook or checking my email and responding to emails. And maybe I study for half an hour or the two hours I'm there. But if I have it written down what I plan on accomplishing and I give that to somebody and then I come back and they say, did you do this? Well, it's a whole different game. Then I, ha then, then I feel much more obligated to get that thing done. So our study tip for today is find an accountability partner and help them help you and set up a, a more formal interaction between the two of you uh, in order to keep each other accountable as you get ready for your exams. I think that can be really, really helpful. All right, let's jump into some questions just to wrap up what we covered today and see if you can retain them through our study tab if you're still with me. So painful third trimester bleeding is associated with what diagnosis? I've said this at least 16 times today. Painful third trimester bleeding is associated with what diagnosis? I'm gonna give you a second answer. Was it, was it abruption? Was it, was it previa? It was abruption, placental abruption. Remember, that's when the, the placenta comes off the uterus. When is it a good time to start acyclovir to prevent a herpes flare-up at the time of delivery? What's a good time to start acyclovir to prevent a herpes flare-up at the time of delivery? 36 weeks. What's the first-line antibiotic used to treat herpes? First line antibiotic used to treat herpes. Penicillin. List three risk factors for placenta previa. Three risk factors for placenta previa. Now this shouldn't be memorizing them because I went through them so quickly, that's really hard to do. What you should be doing here is remembering what placenta previa is. It's when the the um, <laughs> listen to me stutter through it. Um, placenta previa is when the placenta is attached over the cervical os, right? And why do we get that? It's because there's scarring in the uterus and the, and the, the placenta is trying to find a place to attach. Well, what causes that scarring to occur? Those are going to be our risk factors. So multiparity, history of DNC, history of C-section, advanced maternal age, those sort of things. Don't memorize the list. Understand the problem. And then the list becomes easy. A 
take just a minute in your head or out loud, actually better out loud, do this out loud. Even if you're driving or around other people, be a weirdo. Take a moment and describe placental abruption. Describe placental abruption out loud right now. Go for it. I don't need the treatment. I just want to know what it is. All right, and then do the same thing with placenta previa. I just gave you that one, so try it again out loud to yourself. Take a moment and describe placenta previa. All right, placental abruption is when the placenta detaches from the uterus. Placenta previa is when the placenta attaches over top of the cervical os, um, and both of which cause third trimester bleeding. You should know the difference. Pretty easy if you know them, pretty hard if you don't, but you should be able to keep those straight. Excellent. Um, so that <clears throat> brings us to the end of episode six. One thing I did want to mention here really quick is I've had a whole bunch of people lately emailing me in to thank me uh, for the book, The Final Step. If you've liked the questions, especially at the end, uh, the little bit at the beginning, that's a lot of the same format as the book I put together when I took my pay and re. It's called The Final Step, uh, and it goes through, I think there's 1,200 something questions like this, uh, split up by each section, um, each topic for the blueprint. So there's an OBGYN section, there's a musculoskeletal section, and so on and so forth. There's a, And then I mix them all together at the end so that you have to jump around and try to figure out what they are. It just helps with your learning. I'm not going to go into all the details of that right now, um, but go. you might want to go check that out over on the website, www.physicianassistantexamreview.com. Uh, you should be able to find the button for the final step. Otherwise, you can just do backslash the final step, and that'll bring you to the page explaining everything about the book. Uh, but I did want to, to remind you that that is available for you. If you, like I said, if you like the format for these questions at the end, uh, this, what is it called? Uh, unprompted recall and having to pull that information out of your head, that active learning, uh, something I really believe and think it really makes a big difference to people who have trouble studying, people who get nervous on exams. Uh, it helps to make sure that you really know the information and you can pull it back out of your head instead of just reading over it over and over. Uh, you need to be actively involved. And that's what the final step was designed to do. And that's what it's really been helping thousands and really, probably thousands and thousands of uh, PAs to pass their exams at this point. So just want to make sure you know that that's available to you. Uh, go check it out. That'll wrap it up for this week. Looking forward to see you in episode seven. Uh, take care of those who are taking your exam this week. Uh, good luck to you. And please let me know how you do. Take care. Good night.